Let's just fight. Oh shit. Did you hear that? Oh, it said recording in progress on my end, so I know that it's recording. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the lawn and garden section. This is episode five. We had a couple months break. I'm Christopher. This is Jason. Nice to see everyone again. It's been a little while as uh, summer happened, and then we all have to do the things that we do in the lawn and in the garden. That's right. In those sections. That's a uh, that's a good thing. So Jason is polishing off, let's say, uh, a wheat, maybe? Is there like a bumblebee on the front of that? Sam Adams citrus oh. wheat. I, it is a wheat. I was right. Yellow is such a common color yes. for wheat beers. I was going to make a gin and tonic, but we're out of tonic water, so this is a gin and club soda, and it's terrible. Old, I thought you were going to say the old gin and gin. <laughs> no. Oh, you got another Sam Adams. That's good. Well, we're coming Keep together prepared. today to talk about some of the projects that we've done. And Jason recently released a video that I thought was important. And I hope the algorithm catches it because it the gist of it was, you can do it. And we're talking about big projects that really do seem big, that are big, that would cost you a lot of money and a lot of time if you had a contractor for them. But if you do it yourself, if you watch good YouTube videos and you practice, 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 you take ownership of it, you can make something really nice for a mere fraction of the cost. So I want to first compliment you on your sidewalk because that, or whatever you want to call this, because it's yeah. so, so visible. Tell us about this project, how much concrete you poured, how big it was and all that jazz. So yeah, basically when we moved into this house, there was a like flagstone walkway and that walkway didn't even make it to the driveway. There were like three stones that I ended up finding as I was digging out the walkway. But so we wanted to have a concrete path to our front door. And then also you have to there's it's it was like 13 and a half inches from where the walkway level was up to where the path where the porch is. So we needed a step and the previous owner solved that problem by um, pouring two inches of concrete poorly onto a concrete slab. And then on top of that, there was a layer of paver stones. And then on top of that, there was another layer of paver stones. So that was how they got like from flagstone to that to porch. That's a rolled angle waiting to happen. It was terrible. Like the kids would always be tripping and falling if they ran down it. So we wanted to do a concrete walkway. Um, I have no experience with doing concrete anything ever. Um, but I just, I watched, I found a couple, I think Odell concrete and like Mike O'Day, Mike something, Mike Davis concrete. What's the other thing? Oh, yeah. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So a couple of concrete channels and just was watching them do it and was kind of watching it like that's not that doesn't look that hard. Like, I bet I can probably figure this out. And so I went down the journey of, I think, from our driveway to where we kind of flared it out and created a little sitting area off the front porch um, is 30, 30, 33 feet, something like that. And then we made like a little nine by nine square off the porch that we can sit on so it was oh, 100 nice. it was 155 60 pound bags of concrete so in excess in excess of nine thousand pounds of concrete that i and my dad um i did most but he did some lifted into a harbor freight a uh, little three and a half cubic foot concrete mixer and ah uh, yes i heard it broke now you say harbor freight it makes sense <laughs> <laughs> well yeah I th it held on, but we, we took a break at one point, just took a couple minutes. I did some finishing work. And then when I came back, I, I was basically using the water to clean the mixer. And then about how much it took to clean off the excess from the previous pour was about the right amount to start the next uh, mix. And so I kept doing that. And then somehow I did, I did one that had way too much water in it. So I was like, and we were starting to like run short on concrete. So I didn't want to lose two bags. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, I'll just pour a third one in. And then when I poured that third one in, there's a li the little key from the pulley to the drive shaft just pretty much disintegrated. Uh, and so it wouldn't spin anymore. And so, yeah, then we then we had the joy of mixing like 25 to 30 bags of concrete in a wheelbarrow to finish the walkway. Did you use a pitchfork or did you use shovels? I actually used a child's garden hoe. Okay, <laughs> cool. There you it was go. actually... It was actually perfect, like, because I had to go to Home Depot and grab, like, I grabbed eight more bags, only would have needed five. But I had to go grab a couple more, and my, my grandpa was like, 
buy like an adult hoe. And I was like, not, I think actually the fact that it's a little smaller is better. And it, it was, so that was the way to go. Well, between grandpa and you, you came up with the right answer and now your kids can use it if it's not completely trashed already, which. Yes. And plus we already had it. So I didn't even have to buy it. There you go. It's amazing the utility on uh, in kids garden tools or kids tools in general. Like they're not just crappy plastic. They're actual tools just with colors on top of them. I see. Yeah, it was purple. Yeah, that's great. It was great by the time you're finished, unless you watched it. But, I mean, congratulations on that sidewalk. What a beautiful project. I have also never done concrete. But my next question, um, whenever I start a project for something that I've never done before, I watch a lot of YouTube, and I know you do too. I think before I built my shed, which is the first kind of true um, like contractor framing big stuff work, I probably watched like 75 hours worth of YouTube videos, at least. Uh, which I think was worth it in the end for the final product. How much, whether YouTubing or reading, did you do prior to, let's say, this sidewalk or your siding, which is something else we should talk about? Yep. I'm going to say certainly not 75 hours. I'm going to say maybe five to 10 just to get a sense of, okay, what's the, what are these couple people use for their process for framing? Because I had to figure out how to like frame the walkway in a um, couple hours to find like the best way to make curves. Cause we do have um, the cool. walkway flares in from our driveway and then it flares back out to the, to the porch. And so we put curves in. So trying to figure out how to do that. I'm going to say 10, maybe five to 10 hours of, you know, 25, 30 minute videos on you know pour a patio pour a walkway pour a driveway pour whatever um and then just kind of getting a sense of how they go about finishing it and and everything and one thing i will say is the first time you do something especially something that's time sensitive like the concrete project is not perfect there are some edges that have some stones exposed there are a couple um relief joints that have some stones exposed where i didn't get you know all the cream up to the top and it I poured a little bit of it too wet before somebody told me I was mixing it too wet. And then we resolved that problem. But there's a section that's all like orange because the water from our well is super irony. So it's a little bit like there's there's one square that's like a, just a little bit more orange. So that's maybe something to expect when you do stuff like that is the first time you do something ever is it's probably not going to go without flaw. But I'm super pleased with it. And especially with the concrete work, like nobody would even return my calls. Like I, I, I called a, like a concrete company that poured our neighbor's driveway and like the lady did all but laugh at me to, to be like, yeah, we don't do that. Oh, what a jerk. <laughs> what a jerk to do. Well, I suppose small, small batch. They might've done it if it, like you were doing a driveway already and you're like, oh, we're here and we got the guys. Yes. So right, let's single one off. Huh, that's interesting. So yeah. I don't know. Part of me regrets not getting a quote now. Like I'm sure I could have found some some dude that does like concrete work yeah, on the side mm -hmm. to or see whatever. what they would have quoted it to know if I actually saved money or not. But oh, you did by doing it yourself. Um, uh, two things. I don't think I spent 75 hours. I, I pulled that number out of thin air <laughs> as I'm thinking about it. I'm like Jesus, that's like a <laughs> double like, three days. like two <laughs> two weeks worth of work. Um, no. <laughs> I did not do that. I think like 15 probably, maybe yeah. even 20, because I, I, I watch a lot of videos over the winter time leading up to it. So I'm like, oh, it's cold. I'm just watching YouTube videos. Not 75. Uh, the second thing is you may have, uh, there's money savings, but then there's the attention to detail that you will pay because you're doing it yourself and you're going to be the one living with it and you're going to be the one telling the fish story about it as opposed yeah. to some random contractor who's just like, I just, you know, I just want to get paid. I want to get done. I'm not going to come back. I'm not going to see this every single day. I, to me, knowing that I have touched every single piece of wood or every single fastener from start to finish, including carrying it into my car and back, there's something important about that. And I feel confident they'll be able to make any kind of fixes on it in the future or improve upon that skill. Ryan? Yes, absolutely. And actually, that's I kind of stole that idea from... Um, so I follow a channel that's uh, I think it's Reality Renovision DIY is the full YouTube channel name. Um, the guy's name is Jeff. It's a, he's a, like over a million subscribers now, but he does no a fan <laughs> he does a fantastic job of explaining how to do something 
the things not to do. Like he, he does a good job to take time in every video that he does to be like, here's the things that everybody wants to do that like feels natural to do. Don't do that thing. <laughs> that, that thing will not work. Don't do it that way. Do it this way. And so he talks about not, he always brings up the fact that no contractor, no person you hire is going to care as much about a job in your house as you are going to care about a job in your house because it's your house. And plus you're not, you're not doing it for profit. Profit motives are good in some spaces, but profit motives means we need to take as little time as possible. So you need to, basically they're just doing it well enough where you're not going to complain and maybe you're going to recommend them to somebody else. They're not going to take, you know, the, all of the extra time you might take as the owner of the home, you know, to do, to complete a project over a couple of weeks, you know, realistically that walkway spanned a month where, cause I had to, I had my tiller and I just excavated out the dirt and dug it down so I could bring stone in. And then I laid all the stone myself and I framed all of it myself and then poured it with my parents and my grandpa. So like you have the time to dedicate to all of this and you're going to do it better if, you know, maybe you don't have the skill set, but it, you're going to do it as well. And then you develop the skill set. So now I'm looking at like all of the other things I can do at my house. Like I'm looking at my deck mm -hmm. to convert that to concrete and all the stuff that I want to try to do. But, but anyway, yeah. Yeah. All this not to rip on contractors who are indeed skilled artisans in themselves. And would have done a better job than I did. Let me be clear. Somebody, a professional concrete crew would have done a better job than I did. Indeed. But you have a, we have a different sense of passion doing it for ourselves. That's true. So I, uh, I hear that you also set your house kind of on fire. And, I tried. Right. Try to claim, claim that insurance money, but instead you <laughs> had to redo some siding on your own. Let's hear about this. Yes. So fortunately it was the side of the garage that faces away from everything. Um, and it faces toward like a fence. So it doesn't really matter, but it's, it's where the previous homeowner kept a bunch of cars. He used to, he was an auto mechanic. So that was like his parking lot. So it's just okay. gravel. When we bought the house, it was six, seven, 10 foot tall weeds. And that's all it was. Um, so it was the place that I elected to do all of our brush fires, which had been fine for over two years. I probably had 10, 15 brush fires in that fire pit that I had. And then uh, the fence started to fall over. And so I took probably a eight foot section of a six foot fence and laid it on plus a couple of big uh, <laughs> railroad ties, plus some brush, plus oh, it wasn't got oil in them. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> plus I was, I was starting, like I was getting mad cause I couldn't get the fire to start. So I just kept throwing more stuff on the fire. That is and, the uh, proverbial throwing more, what fuel in the flame. Fuel yes. The yeah. And the, not only did I make the mistake of making the fire too big, but the fence laid on top of the fire pointed at my garage. Direction. So basically all the heat was going to come up and then go over. So I'm probably 20 feet from my garage at least with this fire pit. But yeah, I was watching the fire like, nah, it's, that's going to be a problem. And uh, <laughs> sure was. enough, it, it melted all the siding along the corner. And uh so fortunately, there's no windows. There's no like I didn't have to do any J trim work or any trim work, anything like that. So that would be an additional skill set. Mm -hmm. But uh, actually, that was a vinyl siding video by the, that channel that I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. um, and I watched that video like three, four times. And that was that was a place where he talked about like, don't drive the nail in all the way. <laughs> like when you would be nailing something to the side of your house. Yeah, you need to have that little bit of air gap so the siding can move. But you, naturally, as somebody who has no idea what they're doing, you're going to drive the nail in all the way because I want to attach this to my house. But uh, and different kinds of siding will have different kinds of recommendation, right? Because wood will be different than the vinyl. Yes. And the kind of house you're going on to will be different. Okay. Yep. So um, it's a it's a two car garage, plus like another if you like had two cars and then like another car in the back. That's about how big the garage is. And so I did about a half to two thirds of the one wall by myself, cut it, removed the old siding, took all the nails out, bought new siding, and I only needed a box. So it was $150 for a box of just generic siding from Home Depot, box of nails, uh, a little tool that like gets up in behind the existing siding and so you can hook it and disengage it from. Which is satisfying, isn't it? Oh yeah, when you get that like smooth rip all the oh. way across the thing, <laughs> oh. I should have actually filmed that. That would have like been a smash on TikTok or something. That's that's like the Cyberlex ASMR video. Yeah. Yes. 
So I think an excellent place to get experience doing this kind of work is uh, volunteering with Habitat for Humanity. Mm. I've, I've had a chance to do three builds so far um, over the past 10 years. And I remember so much about what I've done. I've done vinyl siding with them. I've done window installation. Granted, they're just vinyl windows and I'm a wood guy, but I've done window installation. And I've done, um, let's see, uh, for roofing, drip edge. I've been drip, bending drip edge and I've installed drywall on studs. And um, like those are some of the bigger things aside from just, you know, the painting, the cleaning, uh, et cetera. But it's so neat because there's always experts on site and you learn, right? Uh, yeah. I'm very much a hands on learner. You know, I like to see it, I like to do it. And especially uh, it's like a micro apprenticeship. And if you're volunteering just for four hours at a chunk, you're going to do one thing, you know? So it may be tedious, but, you know, I'm the big guy. So here I am holding up a uh, drywall, you know, or holding it up to a wall and you do that for four hours straight. And yeah, you've got that one technique down pat. Yeah. Uh, I, I really appreciated it. But I, once you said you were doing siding, I'm like, ah, I've done siding. Yeah. And, it, and again, it was something that was so much easier than you would expect it to be. Yeah. Like, it, yeah, it was finicky and uh, had to measure it and cut it and kind of hold it in place and get it to position and it was two different types of siding so they didn't want to like lock together exactly how I would have preferred but yeah I, I, it's just another thing where I was able to do it despite not having any, any experience and most of these projects would have terrified me to even consider doing not all that long ago so you had a third project is that what I recall what was your third your final item yeah, the other one was uh, small engine stuff. Oh, yeah. Tell us about that. That's so a review of your normal realm, lawn and garden. Yes. So it was actually, and, and I've made a video on like the unexpected benefits of lawn care. Um, and nobody watched it, which is fine. Um, Good to talk but, uh, to begin then. <laughs> so for me, what I when I started to take lawn care seriously, it kind of felt in my in my heart that I should start to learn how to take care of the equipment correctly. Like if I'm going to take taking care of the yard seriously, I should be taking care of the equipment seriously and etc. So I just started with a basic, you know, your normal push mower, oil change, spark plugs, air filter. And I just did that. And I was like, oh, well, that's pretty easy. And then uh, I did, I got myself some I have an impact drive, like it's just a DeWalt impact driver. And I was like, oh, okay, to keep take care of your yard, you need to have your blades be sharp. So I watched some videos on how to do that. And so I bought an angle grinder, which oh. then I used for the siding. Um, an angle, angle grinder is MVP. Like you can do so much with that. I've just, seen people make like sculptures effectively with it. It's pretty neat. Yeah. I like all the different bits you can, all the different blades and saws and everything you can put on that thing. It's fantastic. Um, so I got, so I could take the blades off and sharpen them. And that was terrifying because like, what if they're not balanced right? What if they're, what if, you know, I did, I bought one of those little pyramid balancer deals. And so this isn't, this is going to be the last time you do it. Right. And so I do, I do it, you know, two, three times a year is what I try to do. I haven't done it enough this year, but that's beside the point. And then after I did that, I was like, okay, now I have this, I have a commercial 48 inch hydraulic driven, uh, lawnmower that I use to mow most of, my, most of my property. So I was looking at that like, okay, well, I can do the oil change there. Now that brings in oil filter changes. Um, it has hydraulic fluid, hydraulic fluid changes. Um, and then probably the, the banner accomplishment for the small engine stuff is um, I did a valve adjustment. So as those, as those engines wear and break down the, the valve time, the valve tension basically that you hold it under so that it seals correctly will will move and shift and you're supposed to adjust it every so often and now we're talking about like actually impacting components of the engine that are involved in the engine running and that is terrifying to me next level but again i watched a couple of videos on you know probably watched two three hours of videos on how to do it for the particular engine that i have on there and uh it took me probably two months where like it was probably three, four times I went out to my garage to do it. And I was like, mm, nope. 
And then finally I committed to doing it and succeeded. I'm I, you know, I have feeler gauges now and I have the stuff that you need to do that. And uh, then I found out, I thought I did it wrong. Turns out it was just one of the, the set screws, the Allen, the Allen, it's not key because it's the, whatever receives the Allen key was stripped. So I couldn't tighten it enough. Then it would just walk itself back off and the engine would stop running. Um, but I was able to order a couple parts, change the parts out. It idles. It used to idle really rough and it idles super smooth. Now that was definitely the issue. And just again, I have no small engine experience. I have no, none of that. Um, so kind of the whole idea that I wanted to communicate is like, you're probably way handier than you think if you just spend a little time learning how to do something and then just commit to doing it. Bingo. You know, I've never done any work with small engines, but I, I've, I've pried open three of my appliances with small motors. Um, I have pried open our, uh, our KitchenAid stand mixer and fixed okay. I have pried open my uh, cordless jigsaw and I've fixed that. And my table saw that I've had now for, I think, five years, six years, five years. I've done a couple of videos on that. It's effectively a series of, of upkeeping it. And it's, it's nice to know a, a particular tool inside and out, especially one that you use all the time. Not just the regular servicing, like oiling and cleaning, et cetera, but like if a certain feature isn't working, being able to think critically and diagnose it right. Like you talked about that Allen um, bolt or whatever being stripped and not receiving the key and turning. Just something small like that a lot of people might just, oh, my mustache is going. A lot, of, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people might just throw in the towel and be like, oh, crap. Okay, this is old. I got to get a new one. But I think the industrious among us will take the time and effort to look through it and think, hmm, critically, what isn't working? Oh, this is backing off. So it's probably, you know, X, Y, and Z items. And you check all of them. When I, when I fixed my table saw last, there was this little clip on the back of effectively a long threaded rod that was supposed to stay like the threaded rod went through another locking mechanism like this and as you turn the crank sorry i know this is kind of phallic, but like that would raise and lower the blade there was okay. a clip right here that kept the shaft from coming out i'm gonna get demonetized but <laughs> effectively my my clip had broken and so this was just like out and it was just spinning so okay. I, I had to stick I had to fix my clip. And go, it's awful. There's no better way to do that. Oh, there isn't. And I don't know what it looks like, except it's black and metal. And uh, it's, it's, it is what it is. But we fixed it. And I'm very satisfied that I didn't have to buy a new one. And it's like, I know everything about this. So aside from cracking over the motor and like playing with the copper wiring and stuff, I got my hands on that entirely. And it's a good feeling. So, and, and you can do it, right? You watch yeah. the news, you figure it out. And you go, you are more handy than you realize. That is the theme. That's what we're going to title this video, episode five. You are more handy than you realize. That's a good title, don't you think? For sure. And yeah. I think the, the the biggest thing that I've found is like once you do that first project, then you get a little bit you get a little bit of confidence to do Thank that you. next one. And for me, it's absolutely snowballed from somebody who would have been terrified to do literally anything. And and I I just remembered a story with that uh, valve. So the first thing I, I tried was I went and got Loctite. So after it walked itself back off once, I tried to put it back on just normally. And then it walked itself off again. And then I tried Loctite. And then my mower kind of killed in the same way. Well, what happens is it kills in the same way as an engine kills when it runs out of gas. <laughs> oh, so you kept, oh, do you have a gas leak? Yeah. So actually, the Loctite fixed it. But because it killed the same way when it ran out of gas, I just assumed it walked back out and I went and I ordered the parts. And oh. so I, <laughs> well, and so I, I get the parts in and granted the, the, the push rod had yeah. bent. So I probably needed to buy and replace that anyway. But I, I get the valve off and I put the thing back on. I was like, ah, oh, just check and see how much gas I have. And I flipped yeah. the like gas lid off and I looked down and I was like, oh shit. Well, it's empty. Yeah. Well, that Loctite oh. will overheat and wear itself out eventually. And you'll be happy yeah. with the spare part, right? That's another yes. thing. As these tools age, it's important to have some regular spare parts on there. Otherwise, you'll have this programmed obsolescence and be like, well, get, don't know replaceable parts. Don't you know? So, yeah. yeah, that was more just to communicate that I am, in fact, like super incompetent when it comes to this stuff and I'm able to do it. So if I can do it, I promise that any of you watching are able to do a lot more than you think you can.
Bravo, sir. I'll let you take a sip of your beer and I'll tell you a story about my <laughs> um, few things. We've been industrious over the course of the last year. Like, so last summer I built the shed and then I built a firewood rack and the firewood rack was super easy, especially after the shed. And then this summer I built a, a playset for my girls. And um, the playset in particular was, was pretty, let's just talk about that because it's recent. The shed, I've got a whole playlist on if anybody wants to talk about or listen to my thoughts at length. But that was a huge uh, leap of confidence for me. It's like, for, you know, whenever somebody says, hey, can you, can you do this? Can you, can you build this? Can you do this project? I think in the back of my mind, built a shed from scratch. <laughs> Let's do this. And That's interesting it, to find out. I would have thought that that was like well within your comfort zone when you did that. So I'm actually kind of surprised to learn that that was like a new thing for you. It was a huge, that's because it is, it's huge. I mean, it's, it's eight by 12 base. It's 13 feet at the top. I, I, you know, I did the foundation. I did all the framing from scratch, all the siding, all the insulating, all the windows, all the rafters, it, just everything from scratch. And up to this point, I mean, the biggest thing that I had built uh, were like the, the, the shelving in my den or maybe my nice side table. So I was starting to branch into furniture. I mean, I mean furniture that you keep out in public that looks nice. That's not just like pallet wood, herkadurka furniture that you can get at the, the what's the word, like a cracker barrel. Are cracker barrel is a thing. <laughs> yeah, Anyways, yeah, yeah. Yep. You know, nice furniture. Um, and then the, the shed was just huge. So that was my huge, my big confidence booster. So this summer, the, the place that was a walk in the park comparatively, but really? um, yeah, we absolutely see we, that was fun. My wife and I, uh, we did the Pinterest spiel and we, we talked about, and with our daughter too, about what we wanted to have on the place set, you know, and, and we came up with good ideas, you know, we rock climbing slides, a couple swings, a little tower area. And um, I looked at the space and, and what structures I had existing and I just made it work. You know, we could have gotten a prefab thing, which would have, of course, been easier, but uh, I had the confidence in me from the shed build and prior big things to know that I can work really well with dimensional lumber in a large space. I know how to fill this up. The place that is 24 feet long and six feet deep. Uh, so it's massive. And um, it's also 13, 11, shit, five plus seven, eh, 12 or 13 feet tall. That's so it's big. Cool. It's big, right? But uh, I love it, and it was it was a piece of cake comparatively. I think if I had started with that last year instead of the shed, it would have been a, a bigger deal. But it was something very much within my purview. So you talk about building on these skills after you get the confidence booster. This was a skill builder. Uh, it went so quickly once I got the wood. It only took me four days to build. Um, I, I just I just knew what to do, and I got to do things that I did last time again and do them better. Like. Um, I used a, a paint sprayer, an air sprayer that I've got. So I just run my cable out there and I, have you ever used an air sprayer, Jason? They're amazing. Oh, like, I, like a, like for staining the stain, okay. paint, yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever you want. I love it. So I, I use dimensional lumber and get treated dimensional lumber was cheaper than like kiln dried stuff or uh, different polymers just because the lumber market is poof right now still. Um, so I don't have a shed or a place that is I got I, I got so lucky I, I did the shed <laughs> right before um, the surge last year uh, it's true but I got to I got to spray everything with it so I built it and I've got all this dimensional lumber and I'm like oh do I even want to bother it looks so pretty but no I'll spray it but my technique was great they, like there's no major flaws in it everything's got good coverage I didn't get soaked um, I, I, I cleaned out the tool better this time. Like the, the last time I, I think I was just like spent or thinking, oh, that's good enough cleaning. Like I really did a thorough cleaning of the tool and I was just really pleased with it. And it inspired me for like, like the next two projects I want to do with a sprayer alone. You know, we talk about building confidence. I've got a, a fence that fences in the perimeter of my backyard. It does need replacing, but we, we think about sustainability in our projects too. Um, that's why I like to build with cedar because it's long lasting and it's rot resistant. And it's beautiful, but I've got this old cedar fence that's 20 years, give or take. Um, the man who installed it did a poor job. He didn't even anchor the posts in concrete. So it's, it's like oh, this kind of all through there. And then you've got the natural variation it just as the earth moves. So there are 
sizable gaps, etc. So it needs to be redone. And I have this idea in my head that I, sh I can use all or most of the panels because they're six foot panels, a couple boards on them need replacing, but I think I could chop off the panels, take out all of the posts, which were not quality posts, and then actually, you know, do this like section by section, take them out, um, drill proper holes, um, concrete the posts, put up the sections, you know, and actually um, install them with fasteners, uh, you know, and actual screws this time. He just nailed the suckers <laughs> to the side. So it's so crappy. Um, At least it wasn't like a drywall screw. Oh, this is true. It was not a drywall screw. And, uh, and then when it's all up, since the cedar is already old, I, I could give it some new life and extra protection. And I can go through and spray the whole thing with this nice deck stain and sealant. And what, uh, what sprayer do you have? Um, it is, uh, is it is a cobalt brand. It might be cobalt. It is the color blue and it cobalt. Is, cobalt yeah. Okay, great. Um, it's great. It's, it's a, it's an air sprayer. So it's got this little canister on the bottom that I fill with whatever. And then I lock it in there and squeeze it and prime it and then psh, go to town. And, and I feel like that would be a great way to reuse the panels, give them new life for another 15 years or so, and then make it feel like a brand new thing without having to bug a contractor or pay you know, an arm and a leg for all of that wood. Cause this is a sizable, I think that would be about uh, about 150 feet. Um, so it's, I mean, that's a lot of wood, right? Yes. Granted, the four by four posts are not going to be cheap, but um, right now, if I had to say that I was doing that next year, that's what I would do. It, it, it probably won't come to fruition, but nonetheless, you get the confidence to have these kind of ideas and mm -hmm. see what comes from them. So that's well, awesome. Thank you. This has been enlightening. Do we want to say anything else? Do you have any questions for me? Do you want to talk about anything else? Um, other than congratulations on hitting 2000 subscribers. Well done, sir. Yeah, that's, that's big, exciting to hit 1000 and 2000 this year was I'm very, very excited about that. Um, I, I will say that that video series has kind of inspired me to just build a place at rather than trying to buy one for one, because you can never find Thanks, a like good luck finding a kid's play set in a store doesn't exist yeah yeah it's true so shout out to fleet farm they were so great to work with that was cool i just gotta say you know it's that was my first really big brand and they reached out to me and it was a good thing and and here like these like the videos that i posted in the place that they just got my usual like you know but the 200 people that like watch everything that i put together thanks all of you i love you <laughs> <laughs> but then like the algorithm will kick in for those like my outdoor videos uh in like january february march when the weather is warming up and everyone's thinking okay honey this year my project is to build a shed or to build a play set and then they start doing what we do like how to build blah 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 and then they come through and then it's like <laughs> nice yep. so fleet farm knew that but they were pretty chill they let me go and i ended up making way more content for them than we um had in the contract but i was happy to do it and it was fun and um I, it was just an april to july thing they were focusing the their social media on hunting and ice fishing now you know as we move into the fall and the winter time so yep. uh, there's possibilities to do things next year in the spring and summer too but uh, i'm off their radar for now and awesome experience hopefully i can leverage that if i want to find a partnership with another brand, but it's positive on both ends. It was nice money and I loved it. It's very cool. So thanks. How much did the play set set you back? The play set, uh, I was just tallying this up and it was about 1500 okay. with, with all the wood and the accessories that I got. Now, I, I, of course, shopped around at Fleet Farm, Menards, and Lowe's, which are the three big box stores that we have in Oshkosh, yep. and just to see what they had for pricing. And comparatively for the size that I had, I think Fleet Farm, or not Fleet Farm, sorry, Menards, you could have gotten um, the, the kit, so to speak, so the materials and parts unassembled for 1800 or you could have gotten the assembled and then shipped to you, or like they bring it to you and assemble it on the spot for like 3200 so uh, i know major cost savings and this way everything was just custom you know and built by myself and built with better quality material 
you know, like I use five quarter rounded over decking for, for the actual platform there. And I've got treated dimensional lumber, you know, underneath what is already sprayed. Like uh, those things aren't, you know, you don't have the, the deck sealant and sprain from the kits. It's probably just treated or yep. a, a polymer material. So it, it, it's a huge cost savings and it's a major increase in quality. And of course, if you're designing it yourself, you can add whatever you find. And I had a lot of fun finding accessories and things on the Facebook marketplace. So getting them secondhand to kind of go along with that sustainability. And I built it in a way that I should be able to disassemble certain things appropriately in the winter. Cause we get, you know, freezing cold winters here. I'm going to take down the swings. I'm going to take off the slide and I'm going to take off the canopy every winter time. So those, okay. uh, those plastic items have a much longer life cycle especially since you're not going to go out there in the winter time and, and go on a swing on a toddler swing. Yeah. That's something I should just commit to do, but I just, I have a hard time swallowing that it probably is going to cost me three times what it would have cost me 18 months ago. To, well, to... this season, in fact, you know, think of it this way. This season is effectively done. Don't yeah. bother. Wait until next year. Have, have the kids help design it for you. The market will cool down. That's true. That's a good point. I think so at least. So. And then, yeah, do that in the shed next year. Stick to one. Don't be over ambitious, right? Just start, ah. with one, start with one and do it well. True. I, there's a lot of summer out there, though. I, I, I accomplish a lot of things over the course of a year outside. Well, and think about this. Do your building in the springtime when it's cool and when you can't be working on, you know, your organic material that needs heat and rain to grow, you know, yes. build a shed when you want to walk on your grass and don't feel worried about trampling things and uh yeah april's a good I, time because i like to I work tend to pool yeah i tend to only pick the days that are 95 degrees to do like high manual labor projects gross i told i was i was there too last year in the summertime in the shed i was i was recalling with bridget like these days when it was like 95 degrees before humidity and i'm out there i built my entire shed with a fisker's uh proper mallet and I, I, you know, I've got these uh, stainless steel nails that I'm driving in all by hand, no nail gun. It's like, I get, like, my right shoulder was so like beefcake. I lost 10 pounds in six weeks building the shed. It's like, yes. So I hear fortunately, you. Fortunately, it was a little cooler the day we did the concrete because I had like, by the, by the end of that day, I was cramping so bad, <laughs> like everywhere. I had to, I like put a bag into the mixer and my uh right bicep just locked up so Ooh. like i was just like in here <laughs> and i had to physically grab my arm and like push it back down i kept having like trigger finger all the time so like i grabbed something and then my hand would just be, like <laughs> you gotta pry it apart yeah yeah and actually probably the funniest is so after we finally get it all done and it's like 10 30 we started at one um then i go and take a shower and i'm like halfway through washing myself and i have the the like bath sponge in my hand and my hand just locked up. <laughs> I need that shower. soap. Come on. <laughs> and the shower just trying to pry this thing out of my hand. So it's it's not to say that this stuff isn't work. It's it's gonna be work, but if you can do it yourself, because I even think there's like a, a small company, just like a guy that puts these play sets together. And my a coworker just had it done. It was twenty six hundred dollars for something that's not not as extravagant as what you put together. And like, how big is that? Like, what? How big does twenty six hundred bucks? Uh, I think there was a couple swings, a slide, and then like ladder, maybe maybe some other sort of climbing implement. Yeah. So like, kind of close to what you did, but not quite as not as big. When you're looking at them, um, if, if you look at prefab ones, a lot of them will be, will be rated by the square footage of the play area, like whatever is under the tower or whatever you climb up to, effectively. And okay. a lot of them were around 300 or less and minus 360 square feet. Yeah. Um, so, you know, something to think about. Keep it in mind. I thought it was going to be too small. I thought, man, I should just make it like an 8 by 12. I'm like, no, that is 480. <laughs> why, why can't I do math right now? Anyways, that, that is a big thing. So, wait, yeah. is that, hold on a second. 12 by 6 is, oh, my God. 12 by 6, 60 and 12 is 72. Wait, hold on a second. I have a 72, 720 square foot. 
Six. No chance it's 720, is it? Wait, what am I thinking? Six by 12 is 72, right? Six by 12 is 72. So 60 and 12. Yeah, yeah, where am I where am I getting this 300 from? Well, it's probably the whole the whole playset, right? Like post to post to post to post. Yeah. Play, not just the platform. Hmm. You know what? It, ignore everything that I've said about square footage so far and the fact that my math is terrible at <laughs> well and basic skills at 942 at night after a gin and gin. Jason, I think this is time to call it a quits. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I know we ended on a ridiculous note, but I hope you uh, got some inspiration and you learned that take a chance. You can do it. Closing thoughts. There. Do it. All right. Bye, guys. Do good things. <laughs>